Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session today where we'll be talking about cash segmentation and step out strategies. Um, I am Richard Ayrton, a client advisor at JP Morgan Asset Management, and I'm very pleased to be joined by our esteemed client and partner, Manueli Rosignoli, Group Treasurer at Farfetch, who I'll be putting some questions to. Um, Farfetch are recently new to the step out space, so I think this is a really interesting case study for those contemplating investing outside of money market funds for the first time. Um, Manueli, welcome. Thanks for having me here today, Richard. No problem at all. Um, also, um, timely for me to say congratulations um, to you on receiving the recently announced 2021 Adam Smith Award for Best Investing Solution. I know that the use of Step Out was very much a key part of the award, so we are all very keen to hear more. Um, but before we start, I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes on defining what we mean by Step Out and the investment strategies that sit in this space. Um, I'd also like to share a few statistics that underline how Step Out has grown um, in recent years. Um, but more importantly, I'm keen to kick off um, the Q&A with Manueli to hear about his experience and personal journey into this space. Um, so in the US, we've seen investors utilise bespoke accounts or separately managed accounts, as they're sometimes called, as vehicles to increase interest rate and credit risk. And we've seen that for multiple decades. However, in Europe and the international space, it's been less of the case. And it's only really been since the ECB went negative. And believe it or not, that was over seven years ago now in 2014 that we've seen a meaningful pickup in their use over here. Um, a further catalyst uh, for the growth has been the painfully low interest rate environment that we've experienced globally post the COVID outbreak. Now, to set the scene, um, we see at the moment four trillion dollars in the money market fund space with 15 trillion dollars um, in bank deposits in Europe. Um, and in step out strategies, we make the market around 1.4 trillion um, with significant growth of around 30 percent in the last three years. So cash is definitely moving. And I think it's very timely um, to be talking about this subject. Um, at this point, uh, Manueli, I'm keen to bring you into the conversation and hopefully you can share your experiences as a user of step out and provide some guidance to other treasury teams um, listening in today who are considering what to do with their longer dated cash. Um, so perhaps before we get into it, you can give the audience um, a brief introduction to your responsibilities at Farfetch. And for those not familiar with the Farfetch brand, and I'm sure there's not many, uh, but it'd be useful to share a few facts about the business. Sure, thanks, Richard. Um, as you say, let me let me talk a little bit more about Farfetch for those who are, who are not familiar with uh, with our company. Um, Farfetch was was founded in 2007, and and we launched in 2008. Uh, so we are um, still a relatively young company, but we we are also a very fast growing company. Uh, last last year alone, we grew by over 50 percent uh, from the the prior year, and we are now the leading global platform for the luxury fashion industry with. Uh, 3.2 billion in gross merchandise value and over 3 million active consumers as at year end 2020. Um, Farfetch is now listed on the New York Stock Exchange and we are organized in three key uh, pillars uh, digital platform, brand platform, and in store. Um, core to digital platform is our uh, Farfetch marketplace, obviously. So our Farfetch marketplace. Uh, connects consumers in over 190 countries with merchandise in over 50 countries from, from over 1,300 brands uh, and boutiques partners, uh, and more recently, department stores as well. Uh, within that first pillar, we also have uh, Farfetch Platform Solutions, or FPS for short. Uh, this is our white label enterprise solution, which builds and operates e-commerce and technology solutions for brands and, and retailers. Uh, for instance, we, we power Harrods um, website. Um, within uh, brand platform, core, core within that pillar really is uh, New Guards, an acquisition that we made in 2019. Um, and fundamentally what New Guards is, is a, is a platform uh, that uses a single common infrastructure to incubate and grow emerging talent into uh, hot brands such as Off-White and uh, Palm Angels. 
Um, and finally, the third segment in store, um, self-explanatory. This is uh, this is uh, covers the, the stores that we operate, including brands in London, uh, stadium goods in the States, and and certain brands in the NGG uh, portfolio. Um, regarding me, I've joined Farfetch uh, just over two and a half years ago now. Uh, previously, I was at Deloitte in a treasury advisory role, uh, and before that, I've worked in other corporate treasury functions at all Ridswoods Alliance and, and Caterpillar, where I started my career um, as a management accountant. The, the, the remit of uh, our group treasury function is quite wide and includes uh, supporting m and and other uh, debt raising activities. Uh, we have a very sophisticated risk management function. Uh, we're obviously responsible for, for cash management. We, we have technical treasury accounting ammunitions as well within the team. Um, and least, uh, last but not least, we have a very strong uh, treasury operation function in Porto. So all in all, we are a team of a dozen strong individuals uh, based in London and, and, and Porto. Um, and as far as uh, cash management is concerned, we deal with around 20 different currencies and we have a pooling structure in place to facilitate the, the, the cash concentration and therefore cash investment, which is obviously uh, the topic uh, of today. OK, perfect. Um, so at this point, um, it probably makes sense for us to define what we mean by step out. Um, we have a couple of slides uh, which I think will hopefully illustrate um, this well and the types of investments that we're referring to here. Um, now, most of the audience are, I think, familiar with money market funds, but less so with ultra short and short duration bond funds. So this first slide, um, it shows the full risk return spectrum right across the, the fixed income asset class. Um, we have money market funds at the most conservative end and true longer dated fixed income at the riskier end. So when we talk about step out, we're really focusing on the first step outside of money market funds. And the focus of, of today's discussion will be on the ultra short duration space. So in terms of risk, um, we are nowhere near pushing the interest rate and credit risk levers to full throttle um, that you'd expect um, to see in a high yield or EM bond fund. Um, now, for those of you who prefer a bit more detail, uh, on the next slide, um, we can see how ultra short funds differ from money market funds in terms of credit and tenor risk. Again, for those of you who are familiar with credit style money market funds, you'll be used to seeing a minimum rating per security um, equivalent of single A. So in the ultra short space, we're moving one notch lower down to triple B. And in terms of final uh, maximum maturity, we're moving out from just over one year in money market funds to three years in an ultra short style fund um, with, uh, I guess, um, a proportional increase in duration as well, moving from 60 days out to one year. Um, I think an interesting point to make also on this slide is just around the permitted investments. Again, for those typically using credit style money market funds, so the LV NAV or low volatility NAV um, funds, they'll be very much used to um, you know, the, the, the range of permitted investments shown on that slide. And as we move to uh, a, an ultra short uh, fund um, or stepping out, we can see that uh, the permitted investments is only marginally increased. So it's very much the same set of permitted investments, just investing slightly longer down the curve. Um, OK, so as we move on, um, it's probably uh, a good point, Manuel, if you can provide a summary of um, Farfetch's current liquidity position and the historic tools and strategies you've used to manage your cash. Um, and it would be helpful, I think, if, if you can explain what's driven your recent move from money market funds into step out. Sure. Um, we started looking at our investment strategy uh, last year. Um, historically, we have been relying only on money market funds and, and term deposit, which is a very common investment practice. However, a couple of things you know, happened uh, last year. Uh, first of all, we raised over 1.2 billion US dollar uh, across three rounds of convertible notes issuances. Uh, and at, at the same time, as we all know, we've experienced a, a collapse in, in rates. And 
the, the, this combination of higher cash levels and the ultra low rates environment uh, got us thinking how we could get our cash work a bit harder for us really. Um, and to, to that extent, we started looking into two main areas, one being uh, early payment discounts programs, uh, and, and the other obviously was to review our cash investment policy. Um, and as far as the, the cash investment policy is concerned, we, we wanted really to, to keep the objectives and the underlying uh, principle of the policy fundamentally the same in terms of security, liquidity, yield, and, and in that order. But, but we wanted to explore what other products uh, could, could give us an enhanced return at still acceptable level or risk. So that's the, the, the balance to, to, to strike, really. Um, and another consideration was that given the size of, uh, of our treasury function and the other priorities that, that we have, we, we needed a solution that did not require direct investment expertise in-house or uh, nor excessive resources to analyze risk reward profile of individual securities. Um, so uh, that, I would say that's why we started looking into, into those step out strategies uh, last year. Okay. Um, now, as a, a client advisor in the liquidity space, I mean, I speak to treasury teams every day. And whilst there is an increasing number uh, looking at step out solutions, I think most are still constrained you know, quite rigidly to AAA rated money market funds. Um, you know, why do you think that is, Manueli? I mean, is this just about a rigid approach to risk or is this to do with the difficulty in challenging you know, the, the status quo within an organization? Yeah, the, the, it's an interesting question. I, um, I don't know that I have the answer, but I, I, I wonder whether actually uh, it, it's more down to misconceptions, perhaps thinking that going outside AAA rated funds or term deposits come, uh, comes at a significantly higher credit risk or loss of liquidity. Um, and the, the reason why I say misconception is because, as you've mentioned before, uh, you know, these step out investments products are, are not really the, the wild west. Um, as you mentioned before, most of the underlying security types are, are those that you find in money market funds, uh, although with a, with a different mix. But the, the main difference is that you are really buying further down the, the yield curve. Uh, but although you are buying further down the, the yield curve by stepping out you're not necessarily losing um, losing your liquidity when you compare it for instance to term deposits of three to six months where you really have the money stuck for for that period and that's really the period that you you start to look at when when you want to look at a compare uh, at, a, at a similar performance um, and then the, the other misconception perhaps is around the, the credit risk and that counterparty risk um, I think it's worth considering that with a, with the bank deposits, you've got all your eggs in, in one basket, whereas those uh, step out strategies, they, they provide much more uh, risk diversification to, to different issuers and therefore different you know, companies, different industries. Um, so I wonder whether you know, it is down to a bit of a misconception. Um, and, and perhaps now with, you know, with, the, with the rates coming down and companies having a bit more cash, um, we'll, we'll see a pickup in, in that space. Yeah, I think you're right. I think certainly on the diversification side, you know, those used to investing in money market funds you know, are probably used to seeing the exposures there being focused very much on um, you know, short-term credit issued by banks. And obviously, as you move into step out, you know, that, that spectrum is, is increased quite substantially and you're getting really true industry sector diversification. So a clear benefit of, of step out there. Um, so now let's turn the, the conversation um, to your journey uh, in the step out space. I mean, you talked about um, what made these types of um, solutions compelling, um, but can you provide some detail around the initial steps that you took? Um, and perhaps, um, you know, you, we can start to talk about, you know, specific things that you change in your investment policy, um, as well as perhaps some of the, the analysis which you completed. Sure. I think in terms of initial steps, uh, I would say before investing the time in doing a, a full review of the different offerings uh, out there, 
we had conversations with with few of our relationship banks just to understand a bit better the, the that space uh, and we've tested the waters internally to check the appetite to change the, the the investment policy and i would suggest you know doing that you know rather than investing full time uh, in in perhaps the, the the wrong direction if there isn't such such appetite um in terms of the approval, um, you know, those ultra short and short investment products uh, were not permitted under our previous investment policy. So, yes, we, we had to change it, um, which required uh, approval from the board and which therefore meant that we needed to get the, the prior support from uh, from our CFO. And uh, key in getting that CFO approval and, and support was uh, agreeing acceptable levels of, of risk, uh, which I think is very important. Uh, and not so much in terms of credit risk, but more around uh, interest rate risks. So as we all know, generally, the, the, the longer the duration of a portfolio, the higher its return over the long term. Uh, however, the volatility of those returns is usually greater in, in the short term. So to, to determine those acceptable levels, uh, although history is, is obviously not a 100% reliable measure of future performance, that's what we have. And uh, we, 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 we review the historical performance uh, of um, products and portfolios of different durations to see where we want to set the bar. Um, and, and for us, uh, the, the, the historic frequency of the negative return was, was probably the most important thing over just the, the, the historic rolling, you know, worse or average returns. And um, what I mean by that is that we, you know, we, we wanted to understand things like, you know, what are the chances that uh, since inception an investor would have experienced a negative return over say any one month period and, and what was the, the, the size of that loss or how long would you have had needed to hold investment for to avoid that negative return or altogether. Um, and I think that, you know, um, it, it's very important to, to understand that, although you know, you've mentioned that the, the ultra short uh, still carries a lot of risk, um, sorry, the, carry a lot of liquidity, not risk. Um, but, you know, the value of that investment could, could be below par. So for us, having an idea of how long you're likely to hold that investment before uh, you can sell it and recoup all the original investment was, uh, was, was, was quite key. And I think that, you know, the, the concept of security and liquidity uh, will be still front of mind for, for, for a lot of uh, corporate treasurers. Um, and, and also, I think once you've uh, determined what those acceptable uh, risk levels are for you, uh, my suggestion would be, you know, set it out clearly in a policy so that your treasury function and then operate more effectively and timely when when they when they do an investment, uh, they don't need to uh, seek an approval uh, every time, and and also to avoid uh, surprises uh, the, down the line. Yeah, no, exactly, and and I think um, you know you're right to mention those points because I think you know from 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 my conversations with corporate treasurers, I think the immediate focus is on you know the risk and return aspects and looking at the uh, variability of returns, as you mentioned. Um, but I guess changing tax slightly, you know, what about other areas that are perhaps, you know, sometimes overlooked, you know, what about the um, accounting impact of these types of investments? Um, I know we had um, a few discussions around the potential impact to your balance sheet. Can you tell us a bit more about, um, you know, this process and, and how you overcame uh, any hurdles there? Sure. As part of the, the, the internal review and approval process, we, we've obviously considered the, the, the tax and especially the accounting implications of those investments. So, you know, if you've got the expertise within Treasury, great. Otherwise, reach out to your you know, technical accounting colleagues. And uh, it's key to understand the classification of those investments and the full accounting treatment, um, you know, under whatever standards you, you, you follow to prepare your financial statements. So for us, we report under IFRS, so the focus was on uh, IFRS 9. Um, and not surprisingly, the, the, the focus there was uh, and the standard classification, whether it's uh, cash and cash equivalent or whether it's short term investments. Uh, and the other one, whether the mark to market movement goes to, to your PL or you can park it to OCI. And I think those considerations will be particularly important if you've, for instance, you've provided guidance to the market on 
expected uh, targets around those metrics, um, or even more so if you've got financial covenants that actually restricts, you know, the ability of what you can do, um, having, you know, uh, having an understanding of how um, those metrics are impacted is, is, is very important. Okay, so, so let's turn to the cash management side of things. Um, how important was the quality of your cash forecasting uh, in facilitating cash segmentation? So, i.e. segregating cash into operational um, and strategic buckets. Uh, was this a major facilitator in expanding your investment policy? I would say in one word, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, over the last two, two, three years since I've joined Farfetch, I saw the company going uh, through through a, a journey and evolve uh, considerably. Um, you know, we're migrating from uh, from being a loss making startup to being a much bigger uh, and sophisticated company uh, that is targeting its first year of uh, profitability uh, this year. And um, in that same time, there's been a, a significant shift in in focus on cash. Um, and Treasury has obviously played a, a very important role in creating uh, this, this cash culture. Um, we've produced a uh, detailed cash forecast uh, analysis um, and, and we now have a, a headroom model uh, that is quite sophisticated and we review that with the, C, with the CFO himself and, and with other senior finance leaders on, on a monthly basis. And, and, and actually that, that process, that journey that I call it you know, cash culture, um, has actually been very important to get people comfortable that you're not locking up cash that is actually required uh, to support operations that or that is earmarked for uh, short-term growth initiative. Uh, and, and as you say, you know, uh, it's fundamental to segment the, the different cash buckets um, and also, uh, I would say, set some liquidity targets that you want to have for the different investment vehicles. Unless you've got um, I can see that unless you've got a, a, a bit more confidence around your focus, it's a bit it, it's a bit harder to take that plunge. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's a really interesting point. I mean, we actually work with many clients who, you know, either either don't have precision over their cash forecasting um, like you do, nor are they sitting on you know, very high levels of liquidity, like, you know, more than a billion dollars of cash. But they're still able to allocate a proportion um, beyond money market funds. Um, and I think they're able to do that really to your earlier point, because, you know, one, these types of funds still have a, a T plus three kind of accessible window. And two, I think these types of funds you know, are running high levels of liquidity. Um, you know, for example, our managed reserves fund that very much is the core of, of our, our ultra short offering, you know, holds almost 20% of the funding maturities in less um, of less than three months, and many of the um, separately managed accounts um, that are run under a, a step out strategy, you know, they're designed so that a proportion of the cash um, is still highly accessible. So, i.e., allocated to you know a short term money market fund, for example, to, to fund um, unexpected redemption. So, uh, there is still ways. Um, obviously, it, it may be more challenging um, depending on your. Um, cash precision. Yeah, so I would say it helps. Uh, it helps obviously if you do have that, that that extra confidence. But it's not to say that if you don't, you, you can't. As you say, it still it can be still very liquid. Uh, and and I guess uh, uh, um, back to my earlier point. Uh, then it's more understanding those you know that frequency of negative return. Yes, you've got liquidity, but maybe you know at that moment uh, the investment is not performing very well. So you want to know. You know, do I need to hold that for a week, a month, or three months before I can get all the investment back? Then that would be um, an important um, metric to 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 look at. So, turning to the operational side of things, um, you know, how, how do you manage your investments? Um, you know, given you're sitting on such high levels of liquidity um, and across a number of, of different managers. Yes, we. I mean, we we manage our liquidity very actively, actually, to to maximize the the, the returns. Um, you know, we, we we review the overall performance at least monthly with uh, with the CFO and senior management. Uh, but our treasury analysts they actually review the money market funds returns, for instance, on a daily basis. 
uh, before making any subscription or decide whether to do any repositioning um, or when we've got any term deposits that is coming to maturity, we, we actually check up the type of several uh, parties because that, that can be very, very different. Um, and uh, you've touched on the managed reserve fund. Uh, I would say that b because we manage the, the, our investments so actively, uh, one characteristic that we we liked about the, the managed reserve fund is that it is a, an actively managed fund. Uh, so back to our earlier point, unless you've got the, the skills and the resources in-house to build your own portfolio and manage it daily, um, you know, knowing that there is a dedicated fund manager that, that does that was uh, was uh, obviously a, a useful, uh, you know, selling point. Um, but I I would say the other the other consideration here is uh, is technology, and uh, I hear a lot uh, of that from my team. They're always very keen uh, on on us choosing funds and products that can be traded through uh, or reported through the investment portal uh, that that we use and and obviously that streamlines all the the operations and and the reporting so uh, rather than spending hours and hours compiling all of that information on, on excel um, you know these days uh, technology is uh, is a key consideration as well in those uh, in those decisions yeah it's a great point i think you know, around the um, technology side, I think certainly from what we're seeing, um, you know, the use of investment portals is, is definitely growing. And I think it is very much, um, or it does very much facilitate using Step Out. So, you know, investment portals that can help you manage risk is, is definitely a key focus. Um, and the ability to look through um, from a risk perspective across all of your portfolios, being money market funds and including Step Out, to see really the amalgamation of um, any specific um, uh, concentration in a particular country or a partic particular issuer. Yeah. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so um, we'll move on. Um, so I guess just, um, you know, again, looking at your personal journey into this space, you know, um, how did you get a feel for what other corporates were doing? Um, mm -hmm. It, it, you know, did, did you consult your peers? I know that we shared some analysis via an, our, our investor survey. You know, how helpful was that? Indeed, your, your survey was uh, was extremely useful to to get a feel for what other corporates are doing in in this space. It's you know it's very detailed and shows the data for different regions and sizes of companies. So um, you know we've uh, we've looked at that and and a lot of other literature that that is available. Um, but, but indeed, we also checked uh, if other key players uh, in the tech space and luxury industry uh, invested beyond money market funds. And most of the one that we looked at uh, actually do. Um, and, and knowing that our peers are investing in that space gave you know, us the additional confidence to put the proposal for. And, and, and uh, he also helped uh, you know, the, the CFO to support it. So it was quite keen to, to know what our peers were doing. Well, that's great feedback. Um, thank you, Manuel. And certainly for any of those watching, um, the survey that we're referring to is our um, JP Morgan peer view survey, which we complete once every two years, quite a comprehensive survey. Um, and and if, if, if that sounds of interest, please do get in touch and we're happy to, to share that analysis. Um, final question to you, Manuel. Um, you know, with respect to your investment policy, um, the changes that you'd made, it, do you see that as, as very much a one-off or, or you know, how do you see your investment policy you know, evolving over time? W will that be purely driven by your liquidity position going forward? Yeah, I, I, I think we won't be reviewing uh, our investment in the very short uh, term, but um, Consid you know, we review all the policies periodically and considering the, the, the pace uh, of the business, I'm sure that at some not too distant point, we will revisit it. Uh, and yeah, that could depend on cash levels, but it could also depend on whether we've got new currencies to, to manage um, or whether we, we, we look at uh, investment domiciles outside uh, of Europe. Um, or even, you know, within the same space, other products as we get a bit more comfortable uh, in, in, in that space. Okay. Um, 
so as we're sort of um approaching our, our allotted time um just to wrap up then um Manweli, i mean can you maybe share perhaps two or three um takeaways or key points for those contemplating going into step out sure um i would say use your relationship banks in a, in a consultative basis you know try and understand the space a little bit better uh, and and get a feel for what opportunity is there at stake for you um to uh, i would say explore you know internal appetite before you go and do uh, the full investigation it you know it, it will take you know start early would be my last one uh, it, it takes uh, longer than you think to navigate through all the different options uh, all the different terminology we've not touched on that before but there isn't an agreed uh, terminology um, and so it will take more time than you think to understand the different risk return profiles so start early would be my my last advice thanks and I, I think to your first point as well uh, and to those um, watching today you know use your asset manager to gather more detail I think if you've got a good relationship and a good partnership with your manager, you know, then use them in that consultative capacity to understand the options out there, you know, the, the risk return profiles, liquidity, access, et cetera. I know it's something that we do regularly with our clients and, and we're very transparent about the types of strategies that we best suited to different liquidity profiles. Um, okay, so that, that's it from, um, from me. Um, Manueli, thanks again for your input and time. Um, I hope the session was useful to everyone watching and um, please enjoy the rest of your conference.